here. Uh, my name is Brian Marshall. Uh, it is uh, to my distinct pleasure of serving here on campus for the last 18 years. Now, Lewis House has not been around for 18 years, so if uh, I was just trying to explain this to someone in the back and they were saying, so how long has Lewis House been here? And like, so, so history, CSF is a group, some of you may have heard of, called Christian Student Fellowship. We sat, and you saw there was a large construction project uh, across the road here, so that was the long-time home of CSF for, I don't know, close to 50 years, and we bulldozed that building, and in the process, we recognized, hey, if we bulldoze our building, we need a new place to, to go to while the new building is being built, and so we built Lewis House. And so right now, Lewis House is serving two functions. It is serving one as a temporary home for CSF until the building across the street, uh, which you, if you didn't notice you're waiting, I'm sure you'll probably now glance out on your way out. Uh, when that building's finished, uh, CSF will move out, and Lewis House, who now uh, co-shares the space with CSF, this will simply be the, the place for the Lewis House Ministries, which if you kind of wonder about uh, Lewis House, we kind of jokingly say, imagine if C.S. Lewis moved to moved to Lexington and wanted to start a ministry that isn't just for reaching students, but is for reaching people in the community as well. Because CSF is a student ministry, 99% of what we do is campus facing. But Lewis House is kind of a split. We want to reach campus, yes, because we're right here, but we also want to reach the wider community. In fact, I, I took it as a great compliment at our last event we did, a, uh, a showing of a documentary by a Holocaust survivor, Pierre Savant. Uh, we showed the, showed the film here, and, and, uh, and my daughter showed a picture of it. She said, oh, how was tonight? How'd it go, Dad? And my nine-year-old. And I said, oh, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Uh, had a lot of good conversations. And I showed her a picture of the night, and she looked at it, and she goes, there's a lot of old people there, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, her context for what her dad has done for the last 18 years is, I work only with college students. So she's, you know, if, any, if they're 25, they're old to her. So, uh, but, but I was like, yeah, Miriam, that's, that's right. That's, this is what we're here to do. We are here to reach campus, but also uh, the community as well. So thank you, especially our students and our community members. We're honored that you are here. Uh, Lewis House, a couple of things we do if you're here tonight and maybe you haven't signed up online, which you can do on our website. There's a little button you can click to get a library account. We have a fabulous, fabulous library upstairs. It is, uh, in terms of a library that's not connected with a school, uh, like an Asbury or some such place, this is the largest Christian library that I know of in the state. Uh, of some great bunch. We've worked hard to really curate a, a, a fabulous library, and it's free. It's a free <coughs> one. You can sign up. There's a little iPad up there tonight. You can sign up, make yourself an account, and check out books. Just please bring them back. Uh, one of the other things we also do, in addition to the lectures, which you should have a card. Can I borrow this? You should have a card that highlights uh, some of our upcoming lecture events, including normally do one of these per month. But we are doing uh, an additional one next week because Tom N.T. Wright is going to be here on Monday night. So that's Monday night at 7 o'clock. That will actually be hosted in the HUD as well as simulcast into here and throughout some other spaces as well. But there's a space out back that seats about 500 people, and uh, we'll be hosting that there as well as, like I said, in some other uh, video rooms within our facility. That's Monday at 7 o'clock. But in addition to the lecture, we also have scholars. Scholars for them. We have a few scholars here. Make noise, scholars. We're yeah, got some Lewis House Scholars. So uh, our Lewis House Scholars program is a two-year program. It's kind of a life of the mind discipleship program where we want to help students to, to learn to think Christianly. What is it, what's it mean to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, but also with all your mind? And so uh, Lewis House program is a two-year program where we walk students through uh, a curriculum that, uh, that helps hopefully develop the mind of Jesus in them because as you know, C.S. Lewis said, you know, Christ wants a child's heart, but he wants a grown-up's head. So that's, that's our aim. We do have a few staff members who help and some people I think we've got, uh, we've got Rick Freeman over here. Rick uh, helps as well. He's one of our Derek, uh, Derek Kings, our scholar in residence. Uh, where's Brad and Rachel someplace, CJ? There's Brad Barlow who helps lead one of our groups and Rachel and CJ or someplace. I don't see their hands, but uh, that's some of the staff that we have here at Lewis House. A couple of quick uh, last housekeeping items. Uh, if you did not, if you, I don't know, some of you get an email about tonight. If you got an email, that means you're on our email list, which is great. Thanks. We're glad you're on it. If you did not and you would like to be on that, we are also doing a uh, probably a quarterly uh, mail publication where we're going to write some stuff, put some stuff out there, share some, hopefully some fresh insights with you, uh, no charge, just a, a free quarterly mailing. If you're not on our email and mailing list, 
Uh, we'd love for you to have it. I think we've got some cards. Uh, Reese, can we, are we passing those down the rows at this point? Uh, yeah, we're just going to pass some of those out. They should have been placed in the seats earlier. We got lost in conversation, as we often do here, and didn't get those in there. So we'll pass those around. If you're not on our mailing list, please join. Uh, please join that. Uh, if you're interested in some of the subject matter for tonight, we do have books for sale upstairs. Uh, we have some books connected to tonight's uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. Lightheart, as well as some of the theme of, of tonight, talking about science and the role of science in our culture. And then, uh, lastly, tomorrow night, uh, Dr. Lightheart, we're honored he's going to stick around uh, for an extra evening with us. Anybody seen the Terrence Malick film, Tree of Life? Tree of Life, man, few people? Yes. It, you know, very, very provocative work. Well, he's actually written a book on the movie, just a series of reflections on it. We're actually going to do a screening of that here tomorrow night. We're actually going to show it down here. Six o'clock, we're going to do Jimmy John's. If you want to come straight from work or straight from class, uh, grab a bite to eat. Uh, we'll, we'll have some popcorn as well as the Jimmy John's. Uh, watch the movie, and then uh, Dr. Lightheart is going to just share some reflections uh, from his book, and you will have copies of the book both tonight and tomorrow. So uh, that is, I think, I think I've made it through my list of announcements. Again, just honored for you all to be here. We're so thankful uh, to have Dr. Lightheart with, with us. And so to introduce him, I'm going to let uh, one of our Lewis House staff, Rick Freeman, come up and introduce Dr. Lightheart. Uh, very good. Yes, we are uh, super thankful and grateful to have you all here and honored. Uh, we're especially honored to have Dr. Peter Lightheart with us. And Dr. Lightheart is a man who wears uh, many hats. Uh, he's a pastor, he's a theologian, biblical scholar, uh, a writer, um, a, uh, he's the president of the Theopolis Institute, uh, he's been a teacher, uh, so he's a man who wears many hats, in some cases, collars. And um, Dr. Lightheart is, uh, his breadth and depth of knowledge is, is incredible. He uh, is there's hardly a topic he hasn't written upon, uh, everything from philosophy, uh, he does a book called Solomon Among the Postmoderns uh, to biblical studies and a number of commentaries on everything from Revelation to First and Second Samuel to the Gospels um, to uh, to the arts. He has books on, as we said, on uh, Terrence Malick's Tree of Life, on everything from Jane Austen to Shakespeare. So uh, something of a Renaissance man, Doctor Lightheart is, and we're thankful tonight uh, to have his uh, depth and breadth of knowledge brought to our subject uh, as he sees kind of everything through the lens of the faith. Uh, and so we're, we're thankful to have him tonight uh, bring that perspective on science and scientism. So could you all join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Leithard. Thanks very much, Rick. And thanks to you all for coming out. You could be home watching election returns. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy is on the ballot. <laughs> what you're here. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for putting democracy on the side for at least a couple hours this evening. <clears throat> seeing what happens here instead. Um, I have a lot of ground that I want to cover. I don't know if I'll be able to cover it all. I might have to make some edits along the way. Uh, but let me give you an outline of what I intend to cover so that you have an idea uh, where I'm intending to go in case I don't get there. Uh, the first thing I want to do is sketch a, uh, an accurate picture of how science operates. And this is going to sound like a takedown of science, but it's not intended that way. Uh, it's a deflation of science, but only because science has an inflated reputation in our world. And it needs to be deflated just to have an accurate picture of what science does. Uh, the second thing I want to do is talk about some of the dynamics that lead to what is called scientism. And I'll define that. Uh, along the way. Uh, the topic, uh, the title that you have on your program is the Perils of Scientism. My title is uh, Science, Scientism, and Scripture. Um, so the second thing is we'll be talking, I will be talking about scientism. And I think that some of the, some of the dynamics of how science operates uh, in our present day especially, but how science has operated since it, uh, the, the rise of modern science in the 16th and 17th centuries. There are dynamics that lead to certain forms of scientism, so I want to examine some of those. And then the last thing I want to talk about is the scripture part of the talk, uh, and that is to ask how is it that uh, Christian theology and the Bible uh, uh, fit into a, uh, an understanding of science and how science should operate. Uh, this is not going to be an apologetics 
effort. That is, it's not going to be a defense of a Christian or biblical perspective on science. I think we need to think not only in terms of defending the faith against scientific detractors, but we also need to think about how uh, the uh, how Christian theology and scripture inspire a certain way of thinking about scientific investigation, a certain way of thinking about the world, the natural world. And I'm going to offer some examples of how I think that might work. Uh, but before we get started, let me pray. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for uh, this evening. Thank you for gathering us together and bringing us here safely. Uh, we pray that you would guide us and lead us by your spirit, that uh, you'd give us knowledge, that you would illuminate our minds and uh, make us, give us clarity about uh, what, uh, the world that we live in, clarity about your, uh, your call to us in this world and how we can carry out that call faithfully. And we pray that you would guide us and lead us and we give you all thanks and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So first topic, uh, science and what, how science actually works. Um, I'll say this at the beginning, I could go on and on and develop this. We could spend the whole evening talking about this particular point, but I want to get this out of the way quickly for the sake of time. Uh, modern science and the technology that is related to it and flows from it to some extent is one of the great achievements of human ingenuity and human um, action. It's one of the great examples of human dominion. Uh, we understand the natural world in ways that, uh, uh, ways that far surpass any previous age because of the uh, investigation of modern scientists and modern science. Uh, we have tools and uh, we have instruments that can uh, that can uh, give us that give us the capacity to uh, see things and to understand things that uh, previous ages had no conception of, uh, and the technology that is related to science. I mean, the pure scientific investigation and technology can operate in different worlds, but the technology that is related to science has given us uh, just, a, a, as you know, an incredible uh, number of gifts. An incredible number of gifts for communication, transportation. It's sped up human life. It's uh, simplified in some ways human life. It's complicated human life in other ways. Uh, but I you mean, know, you have the world in your pocket. I have, I have the world right here uh, because of the development of science uh, and technology in the modern world. And I, I, I mean that sincerely. I just, so I just want to say that at the beginning because I don't mean what I have to say that's more critical. That sounds more critical as a takedown of science. It's, I'm not, that's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to present is an accurate understanding of how science works. And we have to do that, as I said, because science and its reputation is greatly inflated. Science plays a huge role in our society as the arbiter of truth. And we need to have an accurate understanding of how science actually works in order to uh, recognize the limits of scientific investigation, recognize what, what's actually happening in science. I want to just make a few affirmations and denials and develop them briefly. First of all, science is not merely empirical. That is, it's not merely a matter of investigating the world around us. Uh, that's true partly because scientists use instruments. Scientists use various kinds of tools in order to investigate science. And those tools, have, you have to be trained to use those tools properly. Uh, the story is that uh, Galileo, when he was trying to show various astronomical phenomena through his telescope, uh, would show people the telescope, they'd look through it, and said, do you see that? And they would say, no, I don't see that. I don't see what you're talking about. Uh, you have to be trained to use the telescope properly. You have to be trained to know what you're seeing when you're looking through a microscope. Uh, and as you go from those more, uh, the, those are enhancements of, of, of uh, visual sense, and you go from those kinds of instruments where you're just enhancing a natural, uh, a God-given uh, sense that we have, uh, and and go into more uh, more arcane kinds of uh, tools that uh, that access uh, parts of the world that are not simply uh, uh, simply uh, uh, that's not they're not available to our senses at all. But then again, you need training, and you need to learn to operate the system, and the systems and the instruments can go wrong. Uh, beyond that, uh, uh, scientific investigation is not just about accumulating facts but it's about theorizing about those facts. Scientists want to save the appearances. They try to come up with theoretical 
formula, often expressed mathematically, uh, in, in, uh, in physics, for example, you want to express your formula and your laws of mathematical terms. These are not things that you see, but these are the unseen forces, the, the unsensed forces uh, that explain what you see, that save the appearances, that account for the things that we see. So science is not just an accumulation of the observable facts, but it's a matter of theorizing. If you're just collecting observable facts, then you're not doing what modern scientists consider science. You're kind of an amateur. You're a naturalist, maybe, if you're collecting butterflies. But if you have a theory of butterflies, if you have a theory that accounts for the migration or the movement of butterflies or the development and evolution of butterflies, then you're doing real scientific work. But see, that's getting beyond the merely empirical. And because of that, it's not, you can't say, look, can't you see the science is true? You can just look at it. You can taste it. You can touch it. That's not how science works. Uh, even the fact of measurement in scientific investigation bounds, out, bounds off a part of reality that isn't naturally bounded off. Uh, we measure things that, uh, 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 in order to measure things, we have to set boundaries uh, and cut certain segments of reality off from other segments of reality so we have a measurable space uh, to operate in. All of that is okay. That's fine, but that means that science is not as uh, uh, is not as uh, uh, readily apparent and readily certain as it sometimes uh, is presented to be. Secondly, science is not pure. Science is not pure. This is a this is the uh, uh, way that uh, Stephen Shapin, a, a, a historian of science, describes it. He has a book, Never Pure, and then he's got a page long subtitle. Like he would make the Puritans proud with his <laughs> with his page long subtitle that goes along with it. And his basic point is that scientists are human beings, and because they're human beings, they have the biases that every human being has. They have the uh, lack of attention, the attention, uh, uh, the, the attention lapses that every human being has. They have their blind spots. They have their ambitions. They have their fears. They have greed. All of the things, all of the motivations that motivate us in everyday life are motivating Scientists, uh, scientists are not uh, uh, pure, objective observers of reality who are simply gathering information and theorizing without any kind of human input or human uh, distortions coming into that. They're human beings, and therefore, science is not pure. It's also not pure because there are certain assumptions philosophical, metaphysical, theological assumptions that are built into even the very methods that scientists use. The methods that science, the scientists use are not merely uh, methodological, they're not merely, uh, they're not merely formal or structural principles, but they have substance to them uh, that determines and shapes what they see and the way they look at things. Science is not pure. Science is contested. There's very rarely such a thing as the science with the capital S that no one uh, disagrees about, uh, except on some very, very large questions. Once you get into the details, there's all kinds of different theories, and that's the way science is designed to work. It's designed to work by debate and experiment and confirm confirmation of experiment. Uh, it's designed to work so that you have one guy theorizing over here and another guy offering a theory over here that explains things that the first theory doesn't. Uh, many decades ago, Thomas Kuhn wrote a, a book, a well-known book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And Kuhn distinguishes between what he calls normal science, which is what scientists are normally doing in a laboratory. They're operating within certain theoretical parameters. They're taking those theoretical parameters on, uh, for granted, not because they have experimented and confirmed all of those theoretical par parameters, they're taking those as givens, because that's the reigning theory of the time, and they're working within that. And over time, you have people working in normal science within a particular theoretical framework, and those, uh, uh, the experiments uh, reveal anomalies, things that don't seem to fit the theory. And as anomalies accumulate, then you have efforts to re reform the theory, revise the theory. Sometimes when you have a scientific revolution, Kuhn says that's a matter of a new paradigm, a whole new theory that explains the anomalies that accumulated under the previous theory. But that's the, that is the history of science. Again, nothing wrong with that. That's the way science works. It's the way modern science is supposed to work. 
but it means that science is contested, and there are different, uh, different contributors to scientific debate from different perspectives. Uh, science is limited. It doesn't a a answer every, per every possible kind of question, and it hasn't, and, uh, at least under the, uh, the uh, theoretical framework that most modern science operates under. It can't answer certain kinds of questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? Where did life come from? How do you account for human consciousness? Uh, those are all questions that don't have a ready scientific answer, and especially uh, you don't have a ready scientific answer uh, because most of the uh, contemporary, most of contemporary science is conducted under a certain materialist understanding. So how do you give a materialist, uh, a materialist explanation for what we experience as human consciousness? Can you do that? It seems uh, no, no one has done it convincingly. And it seems almost impossible because we know that human consciousness is something more than the, the, the experience of knowing that you're sitting here listening to me in this room on a Tuesday evening uh, in Lexington, Kentucky. You're conscious of that. You're conscious of different things that are going on in the room. That experience is not something that is just a, a matter of uh, a material entities in motion. We, and we don't have an explanation. That, that, gives a, that means that there's a kind of fundamental uh, incoherence within science, because scientific materialism can't explain the scientist who is conducting the materialist scientific theorizing. Uh, the, the science can't explain uh, the scientist. So science doesn't answer everything. Science is not. Science is limited. Uh, finally, science is not the opposite of religion. Uh, you hear this rhetoric of an eternal debate or eternal battle between science and religion between science and superstition. Uh, Peter Harrison, the historian of science, has written a number of books. Uh, one of his recent ones is called The Territories of Religion in Science. The Territories of Religion in Science. So you have scientific investigation that explores one territory of reality. You have religion that is uh, concerned with another territory of reality. Uh, and the point that he makes in that book, which is primarily a historic historical investigation, is that that's simply not the way people thought until about three or four centuries ago. Uh, science was not this bounded territory that was only concerned with the natural world and with material reality. That's not what the word scientia meant in the medieval world. And religion wasn't confined to some kind of concern for the soul or simply with spiritual realities. Religion was uh, religio, the, the Latin word religio means uh, something like a, a bond. And religio um, has a much more expansive meaning prior to the early modern rise of science. So what's happening in the early modern period is not that science and religion are clashing. Harrison said that what's happening is that the territories are being uh, carved out. A territory of science that religion can't get into and a territory of religion that science is not supposed to intrude into. What's going on in the early modern period is that those two territories are being formed. And then you get a clash, or a parent clash, between science and religion. But you only get the clash between science and religion after those two territories as form, are formed as distinct modes of life or distinct, uh, uh, distinct uh, 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 concerns of investigation. Uh, but that's, that's a fairly recent phenomenon. Uh, and uh, uh, Harrison, is, I think, is very, very good on these questions. So if, you look at, if you look at the medieval world, uh, the medieval world saw the world as a whole. Um, we're in a Lewis house, the discarded image, pick up a Lewis book if you want to want to read about the medieval world picture. The discarded image is about the, the world of the medieval mind, the world that the medievals thought they lived in. And it's uh, scientific. Uh, it has a scientific, it's based on observation. It's, it, has, uh, uh, it has a theory attached to it. But it's also a world that's brimming with life because it's brimming with the life of God. It's brimming with the life of immaterial things like angels. Um, and these two realities were just all part of one reality. What we think of as two realities were not separated realities for the medievals. Uh, they are separated during the early modern period, and that's, what, that's what's happening in the early modern rise of science. Um, that, I think, is a more accurate portrayal of what science is and is not. It's not merely empirical. It's, it's not pure. It is contested. It is limited. It's not the opposite of religion. Uh, there are some scientists and uh, philosophers of science who would dispute the claim that science 
is limited. And this is where the issue of scientism comes into play. And this is uh, the second big part of what I want to say, uh, talking about scientism. What is scientism? Uh, scientism is scientific theory that is dogmatic about its scientific claims. It claims to be the truth. Sometimes scientism claims to be the undeniable truth, the indisputable truth. Scientism is science that portrays itself as the only truth, the only arbiter of truth. Scientific method is the only pathway to truth. That would be a scientistic claim. Uh, if, you, uh, if you make a claim like God exists, uh, in order to test that for a scientist, somebody who's working in, in uh, the perspective of scientism. To test that, you have to have sci a scientific way to test it, because science is the one arbiter of truth. That is distinct from the practice of science. But I think there are certain dynamics in the way that science operates, and particularly the way science operates today. There are certain dynamics that put pressure on scientists and the, the role of science, uh, pressure that leads in a scientistic direction. Uh, and there are two different threads that I want to follow, and I'm borrowing, from, borrowing heavily from a couple of different writers. There's a sociological dimension to this, and here I'm drawing from the work of Matthew B. Crawford, uh, particularly from an, a recent essay called The Corruption of Science. And then there's a philosophical dimension to the, uh, to the rise of scientism, to the pressure that leads to scientism. Uh, and there I'm drawing on D.C. Schindler, a Roman, Catholic, uh, a Roman Catholic philosopher. So what are the sociological pressures that lead to scientism, or that at least that uh, they don't, they don't uh, require scientism, but they push toward a kind of scientistic outlook, a dogmatic outlook on science, the claim that science is the only arbiter of truth, that it is the only true truth. Uh, Crawford points out that there's a disconnect, and this is a, found, this is a, a, a kind of a background point. There's a disconnect between the sources of science's prestige in our world and the actual practice of science. Science has the prestige that it has because it claims to have, it, became, it claims to be a neutral and particularly <coughs> an apolitical arbiter of truth. Uh, scientists stand back, put their biases on hold, uh, and just investigate the world as it truly is. That's the source of scientific prestige. Or, if you want to put a more precise, have a more precise picture, the source of scientific prestige is a picture of a kind of scientist martyr who is at work in his laboratory, uh, investigating the rea uh, investigating uh, the real world coming up with theories about the wor real world in the face of uh, some kind of opposition, particularly religious opposition. Okay. Uh, that's the picture that uh, we have. Or, you know, we have, the, we have the picture of the scientist in his laboratory, the different beakers that are going, things bubbling. Uh, we have the picture of Thomas Edison experimenting with his, uh, with his uh, electric lights. Now, that's simply not the way that science is organized today. It can't be the way that science is organized today. Uh, you can't build a super collider in your garage. <laughs> you can't do that. Uh, you can't build SpaceX without billions of dollars, much of it coming from the US government. Okay. Elon Musk has, got, has, has developed his big businesses, not Twitter, I don't think, but his bigger businesses, <laughs> uh, his bigger businesses by getting all kinds of investment. The, the, uh, the most recent estimate I could find was from 2015, but by that time, the estimate was that SpaceX had gotten almost $5 billion from the US government uh, in order to develop, uh, develop uh, a, space, a space program, a private space program. Okay. So if, if that's the way that science works, if it's heavily dependent, if it's dependent on huge amounts of money and heavily dependent on government money, it's not an apolitical entity anymore. It's not the, uh, the lone scientist martyr in his garage trying to prove the experts wrong and provide a different theory. It's not, it's not the scientist crank who's trying to, trying to work something out on his own. What the, uh, 
uh, what the mortality rate of this virus is. We can't tell. You can't tell at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, that will not provide the kind of background that was needed to make policy. Um, in order to have the authority, it has to be perceived as non-provisional, even though it in fact is provisional. And often to overcome the gap between uh, the provisionality of actual science and the necessary non-provisionality of science in its public role, uh, science turns into, uh, becomes uh, dogmatic uh, and uh, claims to know things, it claims to, uh, claims to have uh, certainty about things that it doesn't in fact have certainty about. Okay. So the disconnect between its actual provisionality and the needs of a modern society with, and the role that science has as an authority in modern society, that disconnect puts pressure toward a more dogmatic understanding of science. Uh, if science did, was, was, uh, had a much lower status in our society, then it would be okay if scientists could, uh, for scientists to say, I, I don't know. Okay. Scientists say that all the time, in all kinds of settings. I don't know, we don't know yet, we're still looking. We're still investigating, we may never know. Scientists, scientists are cautious people by and large. But once you elevate science into the role that it has in our society, it can't be that non-provisional anymore. It has to have a kind of certainty. Uh, so it's built into the situation of contemporary science, at least, to have this pressure toward dogmatism. The other gap that, uh, that Crawford uh, identifies is a gap between the expert knowledge of the scientists and the popular knowledge of the common people. Um, uh, the universal education in science is supposed to take care of this, but uh, that's not, that doesn't actually happen. Uh, we, uh, if you've just got a high school, uh, as, as I do, a high school level uh, training in, in science, then a couple of classes to meet requirements for a liberal arts degree in college, if that's the only formal training in science that you have, then you have no way of judging whether the scientific claims are, uh, are plausible, much less whether they're true. Um, so, so universal education doesn't really take care of the gap between expert uh, knowledge of scientists and, uh, and, and, the, and popular knowledge. Uh, what happens instead is that uh, knowledge, scientific knowledge gets disseminated in various forms through peer-reviewed journals, through journalists who report on those peer-reviewed articles, uh, and now through social media. Uh, but social media, now in our particular moment, Social media creates this kind of backlash. Skeptici skeptics have a, a, a megaphone. Uh, people get uh, a, a large following on social media by being skeptical about scientific claims from scientific, from public scientific authorities. Again, the pandemic is a, is a recent example. You have people who are not scientists who catch on, who latch onto the pandemic issue, and they begin to question the the the, uh, the public health uh, claims about the pandemic. Uh, what happens then? How do the experts then uh, carry out their dissemination of what they believe is the truth? Remember, they have to act like this scientific truth is not provisional because they have this status in society. How do they carry that out when you have, well, you know, when Robert Kennedy Jr. has a Twitter feed? You know, how, how do you, how do you, how do you uh, uh, convince people that the vaccines are safe and effective when Robert Kennedy is out there agitating about how not just the COVID vaccine, but all vaccines are harmful, okay? Uh, in order to handle that, Matthew Crawford argues, uh, uh, science becomes, again, dogmatic. It's become, it becomes demagogic. Uh, it enlists its own army of uh, popularizers, uh, celebrities that go uh, and uh, promote scientific, you know, all, all the celebrities, for example, that. Uh, are talking about climate change. Uh, this is this is a uh, a way of, for the scientific community to get their uh, their uh, their conclusions out into public life. Uh, and again, that uh, tends to leave science uh, in more of a scientistic mode. It operates in a more scientific mode, or even in a moralistic mode. Uh, it turns into moralism. You must you must follow the science. Okay. So there are pressures within the within the operation of science today, at least, uh, that lead to, uh, or at least put pressure towards scientism. Yeah, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that scientific conclusion is inevitable, but there's a the pressure within the sociology, between, with, within the actual social operation of science that, 
uh, puts pressure toward dogmatism and moralism, and at least a pretense to a certain view that science doesn't actually possess. Uh, more deeply, D.C. Schindler, a Catholic philosopher, has suggested that scientism uh, is, uh, to some extent, built into the way modern science was originally constructed. He says that uh, modern science was constructed, it was founded on a gesture of modesty. It's a gesture of modesty. Uh, Pre-modern uh, theorists about nature uh, thought that there were natural forces, there were things within, there were observable things in the world, but the natural things that they observed were also affected by things that could not be observed. There are metaphysical realities, realities beyond our senses, that affected the natural world, or were actually part of what we think of as the natural world. There were forms and natures, metaphysical principles that were operating in the world. Um, what early modern science does is draw a boundary around the natural world and say, this, within this boundary, this is the, this is the scope of our investigation. Uh, are there metaphysical principles operative within there? Uh, we make no judgment. Okay. Is there a God who's, who's controlling or overseeing all of this? That's above our pay grade. We don't know. Okay. That's, the, that's the gesture of modesty that founds modern science. But Schindler points out that that boundary is actually, it looks like modesty. We're just going to look at the natural world. But that has a couple effects. One of the effects is that you draw a boundary around something, uh, you, you must know what's beyond the boundary. That's the only way, this is a point that Hegel makes and other philosophers have made. You can only draw a boundary if you know what's beyond the boundary. Okay. Uh, you draw a boundary between your property, you put up a fence between your property and your neighbor's property because you know there's your neighbor's property on the other side. Okay. You draw a boundary because you know something outside. Modern science draws the boundary around that natural phenomena. This is what we're going to investigate. And that is, uh, that's already presuming that they know something about what's beyond uh, the boundary. And they somehow know that whatever it is beyond the boundary, whatever that may be, which they're claiming not to know anything about, is irrelevant to their investigation. Whatever may be outside this, we don't need to know that. We don't need to be, know about natures or forms or God or angels in order to investigate the natural world. Because this is the bound of our, uh, this is the bound. This, these are the boundaries of our investigation. Okay. It's, we're only operating within this circle. Uh, what that does, uh, it looks like a modesty, but what it actually does is make science the arbiter of truth for the natural world. Because science has closed it off from listening to theology, closes off from listening to philosophers who would have a different account of what's happening in the natural world. They would, they would describe what's happening when something moves uh, Aristotle would describe that differently from the way Newton would. Okay. Um, but he would, Aristotle's explanation would require metaphysical principles. Uh, we can't do that. We don't know whether those metaphysical principles exist or not. We're going to determine what the truth is based on the boundary that we drew. The other thing that happens is that you actually, by drawing that boundary, you actually change the object of investigation, change what you're looking at. Uh, and again, you can think about motion. Uh, uh, Aristotle has a particular account of motion, which involves uh, natures and, ne uh, and final ends. Things move toward a particular end because they have a particular nature. They move in a particular way toward a particular resting place. You can have violent movement, violent motion. Uh, a billiard ball hitting another billiard ball is violent motion. But if you're moving your arms around like I am up here, that's, that's a natural motion, or if you're, if you're a stone, that's moving to the resting place in the lower part of the world. That's a natural motion that's built into the nature of the stone. Really, an amateur scientist, not a, not a serious scientist. You're a, you're a naturalist. Um, bird watchers watch the habits of birds. Real scientists will watch the habits of birds, but they'll also want to break down the, the, the birds into its component structures and so on. Um, that's, a, that's a certain kind of, that's a certain approach to, uh, approach to biology. Um, and in the process of doing that, modern biology often loses track of the organism entirely, loses track of the whole. Uh, so you have uh, weird, weird uh, ideas in uh, Darwinian evolution, for example, of different body parts that seem to have a kind of independent line of evolution. Uh, 
certain kinds of um, uh, flippers turn into paws or, or feet turn into paws. It's as if the, uh, the, a particular part of the animal is evolving on its own. But of course, those, those, those things don't exist apart from a whole. Uh, Michael Hanby, in a very uh, interesting and very difficult book called No, no God, No Science, question mark. His answer is yes. If you don't have God, you don't have science. But, uh, he leaves a question mark in the title. Uh, he says that um, a Darwinian biology just loses track of the organism entirely. So the, the vision is that you have uh, disconnected parts that are not really parts of any holes. Uh, and none of those things have particular functions, because one of the things that Darwinian evolution does is completely remove uh, the issue of the, the phenomenon of purpose or intention from biology. Uh, even saying the eye is for the sake of seeing is inter introducing a kind of intention that, strictly speaking, doesn't belong in that kind of mechanistic biology. So what would a biology look like if we, instead of immediately trying to break things down, I'm not, I'm not denying that you can learn a lot of things about an organism by breaking it down into its component parts. But what would biology look like if, if instead of doing that primarily, the primary focus of attention was on the organism? And you started with and stuck with the whole, the thing, as with, you know, with the phenomenal world that we live in. What would that biology look like? I think it would look quite different. And not only that, the second point from Genesis 1, uh, not only did God create things, but God created things in environments. Everything in Genesis 1 is classified by its place in the world. And we look at some of the classifications in Genesis 1 and elsewhere in the Bible, and we think, you know, these are, these are dim-witted, uh, pre-scientific writers. Uh, don't they know that a bat is not a bird? <coughs> We all know bats are mammals, or that whales aren't fish. But the Bible classifies everything in the sea, everything that swims as a fish, everything that flies as a bird, regardless of whether it's furry or feathery, uh, because the Bible is presenting a world in which organisms and their environments uh, are co-defined. A fish simply is something that lives in the sea, and the sea is the place where fish live. The land is the place where land animals live, and land animals live on the land. There's this, there's this symbiotic relationship between environments uh, and organisms. So again, what would biology have looked like over the last several centuries if instead of focusing uh, even on particular organisms, but uh, certainly not on organisms or parts of organisms, but organisms in their environment, we would have something, I think, uh, much more like what we see in certain recent movements in biology, which is a more ecological, environmental kind of biology. But that seems to fit the biblical picture, because things are, are created to exist within environments, uh, and they are defined by the environments they live in. So again, I, I think a different sort of biology would have followed. Last point, and then uh, we'll take some, I'll take some questions. Um, uh, the, the phrase in Genesis 1 and 2 that describes Fish, land animals, and Adam is nefesh chaya, living soul. The fish in the sea are living souls. The animals on the land are living souls. Um, Genesis 2, God breathes into the nostrils of Adam, and he becomes a living soul. It's the same phrase. Yes, animals have souls in, in the biblical sense. Animals have souls. Uh, fundamentally, I think, that means animals have Desire. Uh, desire is closely associated with soul in the Bible. Soul is not so much an organ of thought or the center of thought as it is the center of desire. It's the center of hunger. It's the center of thirst. My soul thirsts <coughs> in a dry and weary land. My, thought, my soul thirsts for the Lord. I hunger for the Lord. I long to be in his presence. My soul longs to be in the Lord's presence. So animals are desiring. Um, lower animals are desiring beings. And the soul is also an, a, a principle of mobility. Okay? The things that have souls are the things that move themselves around. Okay? Uh, unlike trees, which can be moved, but they don't move themselves around. Um, but all the, all the things that are living souls are mobile. But I don't think that's the limit of it. I think that uh, when the Bible describes um, these lesser animals as uh, living souls, it's attributing a certain level of 
Um, <coughs> thoughtfulness, intentionality, purpose, personality, animals. Now, if we stop and think about it, we might think, I, I, don't know what, I don't know what you're thinking right now. You might be thinking, <coughs> we're just, excuse me, we're just projecting that onto animals. They don't, animals are just work by instinct. <coughs> Sorry. Um, animals operate by instinct. They don't actually think. They don't have personalities. Uh, they're just responding to stimuli. You may be thinking that. I don't think that's right. And I think you can, if you've ever had a pet, you know that's not right. <laughs> um, you know that different pets have different kinds of personalities. You know that cats have different personalities than dogs, and different dogs have different kinds of personalities. You can have a personal relationship with your pet, right? You can speak to your pet, and your pet can learn to obey your commands. You can assign a name to your pet, and your pet will respond to your, when you call him, by that name. Okay. Um, many people say, many lonely, unfortunate, lonely people say, my best friend is my dog. Is that's, that's the being that I have the closest relationship to, and that is not imaginary. Uh, it, it's, it's because God created animals as living souls, and they have not, not full human personality, but they have a, a kind of proto-personality that enables them to have some kind of relationship with us, personal relationship with us. Uh, if, you, if you watch any, any animal in the wild doing anything, you know that animals uh, act by uh, purpose and intention. They are trying to accomplish things. They're not just operating by instinct. You know, a bird building a nest is looking for the right materials. It pecks around, finds some of the right materials, uh, doesn't find the right materials, finds an obstacle, works around the obstacle. This is not instinct. Our eyes tell us. All we have to do is watch for a while. And we can see uh, birds or, you know, if you, if you find a beaver building a dam, you'll find the same thing. Animals act by intention, not just by instinct. Um, and they have something like personality. So again, the question I would raise is, what, does, what kind of, uh, not just an apologetic, I think that uh, that's a, uh, that is a, a, an important thing to defend against the more mechanistic, mechanistic idea that modern science has come up with about, about animal life. Um, but uh, the question is, what kind of science might that inspire? What kind of theorizing might that inspire? Uh, it wouldn't, we couldn't, we could no longer think of animals merely as uh, machines. We couldn't think of animals as uh, simply um, tools for our use. We'd have, to, we'd have to show some respect for animals that we don't, perhaps don't, uh, 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 scientists don't at this time. But what kind of theorizing about animal life would that produce? What kind of biology would it produce uh, if we took that seriously? That's the kind of thing I'm suggesting that we, if, we, if we want science to, open, science to open out, get out of the boundary that makes it scientistic, uh, that we have to have, and we have to explain how the inputs that come in from theology, the inputs that come in from Christian thought, uh, make a difference in the way that science, not only is science is conducted, but the theories that science come up, comes up with. Thanks so much for your attention. Uh, and we'll take the time. Questions from the crowd. Myself and CJ have microphones. We'll pass them on to you. I see uh, Gene first. Sure. I'll, I just uh, as building off. Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Derek. Building off uh, your last statement, um, how would you phrase uh, how could Christianity save science from itself? Yeah. Uh, there's several things that I that I would uh, I'd want to say there. This is I this gives me an opportunity to put in some of the things that I skipped. <laughs> um, I mean, part of, part of what uh, Christianity does is provide uh, an account of things that we kind of intuitively know to be true about the world, but are almost impossible to account for on the assumptions of modern science. Uh, one of the things that I was going to talk about, that I will now talk about, uh, is the uniqueness of uh, each created thing. 
Uh, every individual human being is uh, absolutely unique, uh, utterly different from every other human being. Okay. Uh, so we have this, and that's true of every, every kind of creature, right? Uh, whether you're talking about uh, living creatures or not, uh, every, every chunk of granite is, is unique, different from every other chunk of granite. It has a unique history, it has a unique shape, it has unique, uh, unique uh, uh, components. Everything is utterly unique. Uh, and yet, there are these commonalities. There are classes, and, and uh, we all share human nature, and yet each of us is utterly unique. How do you account for that kind of dynamic? Uh, and I don't think mechanistic science can do it. I, um, uh, ancient philosophy didn't do a good job of accounting for that uniqueness. What seems to come into, uh, it seems that, what, that uniqueness comes into play with the rise of Christianity and the rise of uh, Trinitarian theology, the, the notion of personhood within the Trinity, the notion of personhood in, uh, in human life, part of which means uh, each, each person of the Godhead is fully God and yet utterly distinct from the others. Uh, and uh, that, that uh, union and distinctiveness is something that's reflected in human life in all. In all so in that sense, the, uh, what theology, and that, that's an example of what theology is doing, is uh, providing an account, providing a groundwork for something that we, I think, is intuitively apparent from our experience of the world. And I think that's one of the ways that the sciences, uh, that Christianity, um, that Christianity uh, um, supports science. That's a more theoretical answer to your question. I think one of the things that is, uh, um, uh, it's, it's hard to know how to address the, the sociological issues that I talked about. The massiveness of science um, and its embeddedness in our society. I think one of the things that in a, in, a, in a more Christian society, science would have a much more limited uh, role. It would have an important role, but it would have a much more limited role in terms of uh, dictating what, 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 tr what truth is. Uh, how, do you, how, how does that, uh, that massive uh, rea the role of science, how does that get dismantled and, and, and uh, become more, um, more on a human scale? Um, that, uh, that, I think that's a, in some ways more difficult uh, question to answer, and I don't, I don't have a good, I don't have a good answer to that. But one of the, one of the things that is, uh, um, uh, one of the, one of the dynamics I think would be the, uh, a loss of, of confidence in that massive scientific structure. With, and this has been happening over the last uh, 20 or 25 years. Is, um, uh, 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 questions about replication, questions about whether, whether. Uh, the so-called replication crisis, whether scientific experiments can be replicated. Scientific experiments are published, the results are published, people try the same experiments and they can't replicate it. So there's a, there's a loss of the corruption that uh, has been exposed in science. So I think those kinds of things have tarnished this over-inflated reputation of science and that might work to the benefit of a more modest, a genuinely modest science. Thank you, Dr. Oyer. Um, so my question is, I'll try to keep, I'll try to not speak in any kind of jargon, but um, it would seem that scientific truth claims would sit uneasily alongside um, the tendency that most people would recognize to treat truth claims in our society as being either hierarchical or oppressive. So that basically the tendency towards what's called critical theory. Um, but and, and, I've, and I've had this discussion with friends who, who are sort of puzzled, how can the same people who push sort of critical theory in one, at one point also be pushing some sort of scientific dogmatism or scientific dogmatism at the same time? In my mind, I wonder if they're necessary bedfellows because they both show themselves to be, uh, the pandemic was a great example of this, um, they both show themselves to be totalitarian in, um, in their tendencies. But is the view of humanity and nature that scientism has given us, has, does it have something to do with the tendency to look at all things as if they are simply constructed or simply figments of our, you know, the will to power, I guess. Um, so I, I wonder, I wonder if that, if those tendencies that we that we see in our society yeah. are, are actually more closely linked than than one might at first think. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have any anything particular to respond to that. that uh, that sounds very plausible to me that there would be 
some, they'd be feeding on each other rather than being opposed because you have both phenomena that, uh, that are, how, how they're connected, I, I, I don't have any thoughts on that. Beyond what you said, I think that's a really good insight. I guess the plot, sort of the plasticity of humans. Yeah. The human person or human nature. Right. You know, because I think one of the, the biggest ep exhibits of scientism would be kind of neo-Darwinian, you know, accounts of, of origins and the, ra the randomness, um, the fact that all everything we are, we experience is just a byproduct of something very random. Yeah. I wonder if there's a connection between that and, and a kind of... Right. Yeah, the other thing I think of is you're, you're describing that is the kind of utilitarian thrust that you get in some of the earliest... Uh, uh, earliest modern scientific uh, treatises. I, I mean, uh, Bacon is about um, finding ways to put put the world to use, um, and he thinks of it as a charitable thing. You want to you want to make make the world beneficial, uh, more beneficial, more abundant to people. But there is this um, kind of utilitarian drive that uh, would um, that's re that's pretty much at the origin of modern science. So that's a really good insight. Thanks. Dr. Barnard, thank you. Could you uh, comment on Dr. John Lennox and his work? Uh, particularly, I think he has a new book out on artificial intelligence. Um, but I, I guess I'm a fan, I have to admit, and uh, uh, see if you are familiar with his work. Uh, I I know of him. I can't comment. I don't know enough to, to make any thumbs up or thumbs down. So I'll take that as a suggestion for a future reading. Thank you. All right. So thank you for coming in. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so just look, from looking at history, many harmful political ideas have been decided to be based and dogmatic support, including communism, the third right wing. Uh, currently gender ideology. Uh, they're propagated by emotion and validated by being quote unquote scientific. Um, how would you suggest we reach out to people who are so dogmatic in their beliefs on an emotional level when facts fail to reach their ears? So my question has to do with the relationship between practical or methodological beliefs and platonic beliefs that we think are true. So what, what we use in practice versus what we actually think is true. So um, I, I think like the modern uh, anyone who believes in something a metaphysical, metaphysical or spiritual nature um, in the modern world tends to still view their proximate surroundings as um, as a scientist would, 
Uh, it, so if someone comes to you and like, they're, uh, hey, I, I'm sick, you don't think, oh, what's the spiritual cause of that? You think, what is the, what is the material cause of that? So we're still thinking of those material causal mechanisms. So um, if that begins to slowly dominate how people view the world, what is the relationship then between that belief and what they believe, or we believe platonically about the world? Yeah. Um, well, I, th I think that uh, you're, what you're describing is a kind of schizophrenia, it seems to me, that you're, you're, ass you're assuming the world, um, the world operates a certain way that is incompatible with what you confess. But, uh, if you think about somebody as a Christian, you have a certain confession of who God is and how the world operates that doesn't really touch your day-to-day -day life. Is that the kind of is that the kind of dichotomy you're talking about? Sure, but in the sense that, like you, you know, you're trying to use something that has predictive power. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, so to try to, you know, predicting, okay, what's going to happen next in the world? Am I getting in a car accident? Am I going to get sick? Or is, is this going to work out? You use functionally the same scientific method as scientists would, trying to understand the material causes, and you don't imbue it with any sort of spiritual nature. Right. Um, I, I, but I, I, I'm, uh, I don't know if you're endorsing that. I'm saying no. that that's, yeah, I'm saying that that's a kind of, <laughs> that's the kind of schizophrenia I'm talking about, that, that you think that the world is, uh, your confessed beliefs are that the world is otherwise, but your actual operational beliefs uh, are com are fully compatible with the scientific <coughs> outlook on the world. And I think that's uh, that you know um, that's just wrong. <laughs> 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 and, and I think that, that for, to my mind, what what needs to take place is a kind of uh, well a transformation of imagination that I think is most deeply rooted in uh, the script scriptures effect. On transforming our imagination, we need to we need to learn to experience and know the world uh, as the, the, the world that the Bible gives us, which is a world that is uh, not not just operating by um, by natural processes or by by mechanistic cause and effect, uh, but it's a world uh, where again we're in this house, so it's it's a crowded world where there are spiritual forces uh, that are that are real. And um, and everything that we encounter is manifesting the glory of God. That's everything we're encountering is uh, gives us a glimpse of His glory, and everything we're encountering is something that's under His control and authority. So uh, I think that's um, that just that that bifurcation just needs to be healed. And I think that again, to my mind, the the primary way that that gets healed is by immersion. In the scriptural Thank you. Um, would it be fair to say that um, the problem of scientism is one where the realm of science tends to protect its boundaries, to protect its autonomy, but at the same time, its its own maybe unrecognized metaphysic of materialism has to account for everything. So. There's a, an impulse in there to be expanded at boundaries at the expense of any other boundaries. Yeah, that's that's yeah, I agree with that. Then, yeah, it's it's both both the both the boundedness, the protection of boundaries, and the kind of imperialism that's that's uh, been an impulse of modern science. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna take a couple more. Got one in the back, and then we'll do this one. I guess I was really intrigued by the statements you had in connection to the pandemic. Um, and as someone without much of a scientific background, I know discernment just in that area has been something I really struggled with as a young adult. Um, and so I was wondering if you had any advice on um, just how to determine who to trust um, and just any advice on helping me discern what scientific claims are true or not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really uh, that's a really great question. It's a difficult thing. I'm just going to uh, expand a little bit on the challenge of it because, uh, for some of the reasons that I already discussed, you have you have uh, uh, the way that some, again some of the dynamics, the way science operates, and then the way that uh, the way that information is distributed. Um, information about everything, we, information about anything is distributed in our current technical environment. 
makes it very difficult to sort through. I think one of the things that does is uh, uh, to find some kind of grounding uh, is throw us back kind of on local knowledge. I mean, you can, you can get a uh, hundred different uh, opinions about um, the pandemic, about climate change, about anything on, on Twitter or on Facebook or whatever else, whatever social media that people are using these days. TikTok, I guess that's the <laughs> um, But, um, and you, you can't really, you can't sort through those. So you're thrown back on local knowledge, people that you trust. So how, how, do you, how do you handle the pandemic? Um, you've got um, uh, a pastor, you've got parents, and you may have questions about how they're handling it, but you have people that you trust, people that uh, you should be listening to. I think that uh, you're thrown back into that kind of uh, direct personal authority. And then a, a lot of things you're just gonna have to, you're gonna have to leave up in the air. You can't, you, there's no way you can sort through every possible question. Um, and that's uh, uh, that's just that's a that can be a that can be a, a difficult thing to just give up. I'm just going to put this to the side. I will never know what's true here, but that's that has to be part of it because you can't know everything. Obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question was uh, so. When it comes to, for example, medical science, there are certainly areas that are far easier for a person of faith to reach an area of expertise, to reach a level of expertise, whereas there are others, like, for example, psychiatry, where you are limited. There are many people who would not pursue that because of their Christian faith is so incompatible with the scientific um, boundaries that are set around that field, you know, to say that. Um, so, what do you say to someone who is wanting to pursue science that is more strongly bounded by falsehood. Does that make sense? Like people who um, want to perhaps become an expert in an area where the only people who are allowed to be experts in that area accept things we would not agree with. I don't, I'm not able to target okay. it with that. Well, right? I, I understand yeah. what you're saying. Um, well, first of all, uh, this is a, a kind of side comment. Um, I'm not sure that uh, uh, the medical world is as uh, as open and free. I think that, and I think there are, um, I think there are restrictions um, and, and 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 inhibitions for Christians in the, in the medical in the medical fields. Um, I guess part of my answer would be that uh, um, several fold. One is uh, there's there are ways to pursue. Uh, faithfully pursue uh, any any kind of course of study. Um, you go into you go uh, you, took, you mentioned psychiatry. Uh, you go into psychiatry. Your aim is to be uh, teaching on um, the human psyche in a Christian setting uh, with Christian foundations. But you need to get the uh, you need to go through the process of the training in order to get there. Uh, that is possible. People do do that. People go through the training and they retain their faith and they come out and they are able to be able to operate in those fields as Christians. Um, so, uh, but you need to have, you, they need to have a, a clear idea of what the aim is. Um, they need to be thinking, uh, you know, if they want to rise to the head of the American Psychiatric uh, Association, they're not going to get there. If they wanted to get this training and glean what they can in order to teach psychiatry in a Christian college or something, Again, there are faithful ways to do that. Um, uh, the, other, the other thing I was going to say for, for hard sciences, and this would probably be true of psychiatry too, but in uh, uh, the vast majority of science, scientists are operating in very circumscribed areas of their field. I mean, if you talk to if you talk to the normal, uh, you talk to a biologist who's not doing theoretical biology. Uh, Evolution, evolutionary theory has very little to do with what he's doing on a day-to-day -day basis. He's investigating some, some fairly, uh, again, fairly circumscribed area. So that, um, I, mean, I, I had uh, friends when I was doing my PhD, or friends who were working in the sciences, and that's what, that, was their, uh, that was their experience, that it just, 
uh, those those larger questions didn't impinge on their work very much. They would have to they would have to cover them in certain classes. Uh, but again, if if there's if the goal is to have uh, to be contributing to a body of knowledge, a scientific body of knowledge, um, and that you have the skills and you're you're called to do that, there are ways to do that without uh, without being without being barred from it uh, as a Christian. I think it depends on, also depends a lot on where you uh, institutions that you're where you're uh, where you're trying to study institutions where you're trying to get a job because some are going to be more uh, open and some are going to be less. Thank you. Well, thank you so. Thanks so much, Dr.